Hey there, it's Rick Nusky. If you're looking for a better, more cost-effective way to promote your business, then lock in your spot on the My Future Business Show today. Just go to our bookings page, follow the prompts, and I'll talk with you soon. I think a lot of people don't even realize that their real estate agent has lied to them in the past. You know, they have this trust in this real estate agent who wasn't even honest with them, and I think that's a real problem. Hello there and welcome back to the My Future Business Show. My name's Rick Nusky. I'm your host. It's just so wonderful to be that person for you because serving you is what I love to do. I, I get up of a morning, I think, how best can we improve the My Future Business Show today? And I tell you what, there's some great ideas coming through uh, the channel. So and I'd like to just uh, take a, a moment of pause to thank some people that have uh, you know, been giving uh, their feedback through our contact page. And if you'd like to do so, make sure you visit the My Future Business site and do that. And we got one uh, bit of feedback from Taylor. He says, thanks for all the different tof topics that you're covering on the show. So thanks very much for that, Taylor. Uh, now on today's show, I have the pleasure of welcoming the author of Agents Are Liars and Real Estate Specialist, David Lampy. Welcome to the show, David. Thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Absolutely, a pleasure to have, have you here. Now you and I are gonna be talking about how to save thousands of dollars when buying or selling a home and how people can find great agents and say goodbye to the greedy ones. Now, <laughs> there's some pretty <laughs> confronting things. I love the cover of your book and we're obviously gonna be taking a look at that which people can find at agentsareliars.com. But it's really, it's, it's pretty obvious what your domain's about. It's pretty obvious what the book's about. <laughs> but uh, before we jump into the core of that and talk all about that, where are you calling in from today, David? Uh, Denver, Colorado. Beautiful. Love the place. How long have you lived there? Uh, almost my whole life since oh. I was three years old. Wow. So tell us about uh, life growing up there. Has it changed? Oh, yeah, it's changed a lot. It's grown uh, very much. We have a lot more traffic and <laughs> it's a lot <laughs> different than it used to be. That's for sure. <laughs> now, when I was growing up, I remember, you know, not having to be home until the, till the street lights came on. What, what do you think? Uh, what do you remember of your childhood? Yeah, I remember that same thing. Yeah, we used to stay out as long as we possibly could until it got dark out in the summer. And yeah, it seems like it's a little different these days. You don't see kids out just playing all the time in the streets like that. No, it's it's a funny thing, isn't it? You know, and technology has certainly taken um, a, a big place in their lives, especially our kids. And, you know, um, yeah, I think there's some, uh, some validity in getting outside. What do you reckon about that? Do you like to get outside yourself? Oh, yeah, I love to. I have a dog and I, I take her for a walk every day. I just got back from a walk and I also take her for runs three times a week. Too. What, sort of, what sort of dog do you have? She's a chocolate lab. Oh, lab. Wow. Is she a hairy one? Like, does she drop a um, lot of hair? Yeah, she does. She's short hair, but it, it, she definitely sheds a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I tell you, I've got a very special spot in my heart for pets because, you know, they, they have a calming effect on us, don't they? Yeah. And they get us out to exercise too, so oh, that's a yeah. good thing. Absolutely. Now, when you, were, when you were a kid, did you have any pets back then? Yeah, I had a couple of dogs when I was a kid too. Yeah, fantastic. Now, do you like sports? Um, well, a lot of people here do a lot of different things like running and, and biking, bike riding, um, skiing, of course, and, and winter sports. Yeah, shoeing all that kind of stuff and hiking. Yeah, I like doing all that kind of stuff, all we, that outdoor stuff. We talk about this because it, you know, it, it gives some context um, behind the person behind the business. And obviously, we're going to be touching on your professional life, which I know that you've been involved with for a long deal of time. But um, you know, when we get some time away from business, I personally like to go out with friends and have have a meal. Do you do anything like that? Do you enjoy socialising? Yeah, definitely. Actually, I'm meeting some friends this evening at a, it's called Edgewater Public Market. It's one of those new places with a whole bunch of different restaurants in one place. Yeah, fantastic. Now you, given your line of work, you'd have to be engaged with so many different people. Do you find that uh, you're an introvert at heart or are you extroverted, do you think? You know, kind of in the middle, I guess. I'm kind of different than most real estate agents out there in that I have a degree in computer science. And oh, wow. I used to do um, computer programming and then website uh, marketing and that type of thing. Um, so it's quite different <laughs> than what a lot of agents. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a good thing. You got, you've got a different angle to come in from. Now, when I was growing up, I had this one particular person I always used to look to for advice. And I always ask this question, do, who, do you, who did you have in your life? Did you have anybody in your formative years that really had an impact on you and the way you think, do you think? Well, yeah, definitely. Um, I think the school I went to helped. It was 
kind of a little different. It was called an open school when I was in elementary school. Oh. And so we, you know, got to do things more, more projects and traveling and, and things like that. Um, and I think that helped me become a lifelong learner. And then one other thing that really influenced me in my teenage years is my parents mm -hmm. um, were buying and selling homes, investment properties. Uh -huh. And I got interested in real estate at that time. Yeah, love it. Now you talked about lifelong learning. How best do you learn? Do you, are you an audio book type of guy or do you like hardback books? What's your thing? You know, mostly I like uh, paperback books, I'd say, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or hardback books. Uh. <laughs> just, I, there's something I like about like flipping you know, flipping the pages, I guess. Yes. Although I do, do read the, the Kindle books as well. It's funny because it makes me think about you as an author. Do you get, do you see power in the pen or are you a typer? Uh, typing, basically. Yeah. <laughs> I guess yeah. maybe that's kind of from my computer background. Yeah, I don't really have yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no big pens in this home. <laughs> now tell me, where do you get your best ideas from? When do they come to you? Um, so really the idea for this book came about last year. Well, even a little before that, yeah. I was seeing, you know, all, all these um, lies that real estate agents tell uh, primarily to get clients. And I had like one client in particular um, or a potential client who got taken advantage of by an agent. And ended up, you know, it costing her a lot of money. And that's what really spurred me into writing the book. Yeah. And then as far as like ideas of writing the book, you know, I've been in doing this for so long for uh, 14 years, basically, that I've pretty much seen it all in the real estate world. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, it's all it's kind of all in my head. I guess. <laughs> well, not anymore. It's in the book, isn't it? True. Now, now tell me, when do you write? Uh, do you, are you a morning type of person or afternoon? Uh, you know, because I'm still selling real estate, I would write whenever I could, basically, because yes. my schedule is all over the place. You know, I might have to go show houses or go to a listing appointment, and I would fit in writing in between. Hey, in all of this, being that you're a busy professional, do you have any find any time to actually, you know, just take a break and slow down a bit? And is that important to you? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I I try to go at least once a year on a vacation somewhere because mm -hmm. I think that makes a huge difference. And then the, you know, getting outside with my dog and that kind of thing helps yeah, yeah. a lot. So where do you want to go next? Do you have any travel plans? You know, I really kind of want to go to Europe next. Ah. I, it's been a while. It's been 20 years since I've been to Europe. So yes. I want to go back to Europe. So where was the last <laughs> place that you went to that you really enjoyed? Um, Hawaii last summer. Oh, geez, I'm, I'm green with envy. I'd love to go there. But now, tell me, um, you, you obviously get up early in the morning and you're into it straight away. Um, you know, sometimes I wake up in the morning, I just want to go back to sleep because I just can't be bothered. Do you ever have those days? And what do you do to motivate yourself? <laughs> um, well, yeah, definitely. I always get up at 5.30 every day. And um, I think uh, coffee helps. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. I, we went out and bought a, a very nice coffee machine. Are you an instant type of guy or do you like to make your own coffee, so to speak? I make my own. Yes, yeah, yeah. very nice. Is, are you a, a short black, a long black? Do you have a special uh, special type? Just plain old black Just, coffee. Oh, beautiful. Mm. Keep it simple for me, he says. <laughs> now, yeah. in, in all the time that you've been working in real estate, it's been, what, 14 years now, nearing 15. What's the one thing that has really stood out for you over that period of time? What have you learned the most? You know, I guess one thing that really stands out um, the most probably is how incredibly crazy it got after COVID hit. You know, mm -hmm. right when it hit, we all were like, well, what's going to happen? And, you know, they stopped showings completely for a couple months here. And then right after that, it just went crazy. Yeah, <laughs> for yeah. For two years, it was just nonstop. Mm. Um, so I think that was the the strangest thing I've seen, really. Uh, other than when I first got into it, it was during the housing crisis, and there were lots of foreclosures, and so had some strange experiences at that time. You know, showing homes, foreclosed homes where the power was out, and yes. it was kind of scary sometimes. Wow. That kind of thing. So that was back in two thousand and eight, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, I got my license in two thousand nine, and oh. pretty much. You know, we still had foreclosures and short sales through like 2011, pretty much. Here. See, it's funny because you're flying in the face of convention. People would have thought, why would I bother getting into that type of industry during that period of time shortly after the 2008 crash? What inspired you? 
Well, like I said, I was always interested in yeah. real estate yeah. since I was a teenager. And then I uh, actually bought another home in 2009 um, and kept my home I had at the time as a rental property. And that got me more interested in real estate again. And I think, you know, I <laughs> people were always saying, why are you getting into real estate? And I think it was re actually it turned out to be a really good time because it gave me time to learn it before it got too crazy busy. And I got to work with a lot of investors during the time that were buying rental properties. Mm -hmm. And since I had a little bit of experience with that, you know, through my parents and then myself, um, I was knowledgeable about rental properties. And I, it was, you know, the people that bought all the rental properties at that time, they've been selling them over the last couple of years and they've made a lot of money. Yeah. So talk about, uh, if you don't mind, David, the cycles that we go through. We're currently, um, I'm hearing murmurs of a recession. It seems to be a lot of cause and effect in, in the game that you're involved with. And tell us a, a little bit about what you're seeing at the moment, because I'm hearing you know, that there's a recession coming and everything that happens to America seems to trickle on to everybody else. Would that be fair? Yeah, it's uh, interesting. Our prices peaked last April. And, you know, at that time we were getting, you know, 20 offers on each listing we would list. Everything was going for way over asking price. And then since then, prices have gone down, but they've really only gone down about 3% here yeah. over that past yeah. year. So not a whole lot. And it's been a little bit slow over these past few months. We have really had almost nothing for sale. I think a lot of that is because so many people bought and locked in these low interest rates over the past several years that they don't want to sell and move because they, you know, they'll give up that rate. Yeah. Um, that's part of our problem. And then, but we are seeing as we head into the spring here, because we're kind of cyc cyclical here, mm. uh, we're starting to see the market pick up right now over the past couple of weeks. And also part of that is interest rates went down just a little bit. It seems like the buyers are really sensitive to interest rates right now. When they went up to over 7% here for the 30 year fixed, things mm. really slowed down for a little while. Now they're more in the sixes six and a half percent or about right at the moment, sometimes a little lower depending on the lender. And, you know, just that little bit has made a difference with buyers. So what are you seeing? Is uh, like the townhouse style or the freestanding type of properties more popular? Which ones do you think? I would say here, uh, the freestanding um, mm -hmm. single family detached homes are definitely the most popular. So many people around here are very, you know, outdoor oriented and have dogs. We have a ton of dogs. So people tend to want a yard for their dog. Do you get involved with commercial um, real estate as well? Or? I do not, no. No, no, fantastic. Well, look, um, absolutely loving this call. I love to explore some of the benefits, if you don't mind. Tell us some of the benefits of people getting a portfolio of homes. Is there a benefit? I think it, it was one of the smartest decisions I made mm. of getting, you know, starting out with that rental property. And then also, I think it was in 2011, I bought a foreclosure as another rental property. And then I um, exchanged it into another rental property. So I, I think financially it's been the best decisions I've made, you know, buying real estate. You know, people are always saying they're gonna wait for the crash to buy. I've, I had people like three or four years ago telling me that. And I, I look back at the, you know, those people, not that I've had any communication with them, but you know, now prices have doubled since then, yeah, <laughs> since three amazing. or four years ago. And it's like, now they'll never be able to buy. So tell me, I, I have these questions popping up in the mind. Is there a sweet spot in terms of, of the number of properties somebody should invest in? Uh, not really. I think it kind of depends on how much time you want to devote to it or if you want to hire a management company to manage it for you. Mm. Of course, they, they'll take about like 10 percent pretty much of, of whatever the rent is. Um, but, I, you know, for me, because I am kind of busy, I actually went down to one rental property and it's a townhouse, an attached home where the HOA takes care of all the maintenance on the exterior. And for me, that works really well because I just, I don't have time to deal with a bunch of problems. No, nobody wants problems. <laughs> now tell me, who do you service? What, what is the only local area or is what you're talking about in your book something that can be used uh, across the nation? So I personally only work in the Denver metro area and a little beyond there, but um, the book is uh, applicable to anyone, uh, definitely in the United States, and I think even some of uh, other countries too. Yep. Um, you know, there's a little bit of differences in other countries, but overall, 
you know, I, I know there's agents out there all over the world who are telling lies, you know, yeah. to get business. Mm. Okay, well, we'll talk about that in a moment. We'll take a very deep dive into the book and the, I guess the construct of it. But I'd love to ask you a little bit about, um, just for the sake of context, if you don't mind, David, a little bit about your education and professional background, just so people who have been firstly introduced to you today, that would be wonderful. Yeah, so I, um, like I mentioned before, uh, mm. got a bachelor's degree in computer science, mm. um, and I've done worked in a lot of different things as far as IT, information yep. technology, mm. uh, networking and programming, and website development and design and that and marketing and that kind of thing. And especially that website part has really helped me in the real estate part because, you know, so much of uh, marketing homes now is about the internet. Nobody's out there, you know, <laughs> just calling their agent to find out about homes. They're all out searching on the internet to find homes. So it's it's really important that the website part of it. There's a couple of things that I take from that. I see um, virtual walkthrough technology. What do you think of that? I think it's awesome, uh, especially during like the COVID times when, you know, people were hesitant to go, you know, out and, and, and meet with people. Uh, it was really great. Um, we, we've been doing the 3D tours for all of our listings for years now yeah. um, because it, it just makes a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely love it. You know, you don't have to go anywhere. It's a lot easier for people as long as you've got a very high quality camera, which most of our smartphones do nowadays, don't they? That's true. Yeah. And I, I actually hire professional photographers to shoot all of my listings. Yep. Just They just do a better job than I can do personally. <laughs> now, I, I know that you uh, are committed to video. You uh uh, you enjoy using video and imagery. How important is video becoming in your space? It's becoming really important too. You know, I mean, YouTube is, I think they say like the second largest search engine. So many people search for things on there that you don't, you really have to have some presence there for your listing, your home listing in order to get those eyeballs on it. Yeah. Well, there seems to be obviously a lot of, um, um, eyeballs on each other in terms of, you know, what's the other real estate doing? What, what are some of the things that you're seeing coming through at the moment that really catch your eye? Uh, you know, I think the, like you mentioned, like the 3D tours and, and, and professional photography, and then, you know, just making it really easy for the consumer to find what they're looking for. Um, you know, even part of that is about signage, like our signage, you can text right from your car sitting in your car and bring up a link to the 3D tour or schedule a showing, you know, right there all on a calendar so that you don't have to, you know, make that phone call. Because especially I find so many uh, younger people want to communicate via text primarily or email. Yeah. They really don't want to pick up the phone and talk to somebody. No, I, I like the QR codes. Are you using those? Yeah, we do use those too. Yeah. Any way that we can get somebody to the website that has all the information in the 3D tour is is what we're trying to do. Now, I know that there, there's always this question of intergenerational differences and the way in which you would have to deal with them because they learn differently. They, uh, you know, are attracted to different things. They consume information differently. Tell us a little bit about um, the differences in how uh, your clientele, what are they made, who are they made up of? And, uh, you know, what are some of the techniques that you use to work with people to serve yeah. them? So I work anywhere from first time home buyers, you know, people in their early to mid 20s, usually all the way to uh, people that are downsizing, you know, retire retirees who are selling their bigger home and moving into like these 55 plus communities, for example. Mm. Uh, and as far as communication, I think the main difference I see is that the younger people tend to want to text. And, you know, older, more retired people tend to want to always talk on the phone. <laughs> those, are the, those are the main differences. They're, that they're the differences in modus operandi. But I think there's some com commonalities throughout, at least uh, what I can see is uh, uh, trust and communication and real relationships. How important are those things in your world? Oh, very much important. Yeah. And I think, you know, that brings a little bit about the book in there. I think a lot of people don't even realize that their real estate agent has lied to them in the past. And and so, you know, they have this trust in this real estate agent who wasn't even honest with them. And I think that's a real problem. Mm. Yeah, well, it's interesting that you called the book what you have and the website, Agents Are Lies. And given that you are in that field, you know, it must be fairly, you know, confronting, I guess, at times. People are going, what do you mean agents are lies? How do you go about building trust when, you, <laughs> when you're saying agents are liars? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, yeah, I, I go into into detail in the book about how not and it's not all agents are liars. It's yeah, just yeah. <laughs> primarily like desperate, you know, struggling agents who are, yeah. who are out there telling the most lies. Yeah. And then I, I go into detail about how to find a, a good agent and that you should treat it as a business decision because really it, it should be a business decision, not an emotional decision. I know that's hard because your home, you know, you have a lot of emotions around your home, whether of you're course. buying or selling. Yeah. And so it can be hard to separate that. But the more you can treat it as a business decision, the better. Well, you know, because people sometimes are under duress. There's some some legal issues or whatever the reason might be for having to sell. And like you said, they're emotionally charged. How important is to, is it for you to be empathetic when, when dealing with these types of situations? Oh, very much so. I have lots of clients who, for example, have been going through a divorce and that's mm. why they have to sell the home. And, you know, it, it can be hard and you've got to, you kind of almost have to be like a, a therapist in a way. Mm. Um, because sometimes you're between the two people, you know, it's, yeah. it's it can be kind of difficult at times, but you just got to, yeah, you know, got to be empathetic and, and, you know, and be nice and, and, and do the best job you can. <laughs> How long did it take you to actually write the book, Dave? Uh, it took me about six months. Six months. And it was a, it, did it just flow onto the, through the keyboard for you or? Uh, at times. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> at other times I would hit like writer's block and that kind of thing. Yep. Um, you know, interestingly, I did use a little bit of, um, it's just been in the news a lot, AI, uh, when I would hit writer's block and, you yep. know, ask it some, a question and, and it would, you know, sometimes uh, as it's been talked about recently, it will come up with just bizarre stuff. That's totally <laughs> the opposite of what's true, yep. but in a way as a, as an author, that's still helpful because even if it's the exact opposite, then I can look at it and be like, Oh, I, you know, that's actually kind of interesting. I'll write about this but you know, from the opposite point of view, yeah. for example. <laughs> yeah, well look, there's going to be a lot of people on the on the uh, show today, uh, David, who want to know a little bit about what's inside. I'm wondering if we can, I guess, break it down and, and talk about its structure and all, the, on, and all the content. Would you mind doing that? Sure, yeah. So I start out uh, with the first chapter uh, with 39 lies that real estate agents use. Um, these are lies that they use for buyers and sellers. I would say more for sellers. Uh, it's just kind of easier or, or there's a lot of agents out there who are kind of desperate to get listings. And so they will tell a seller anything they want to hear to get that listing. Yeah. Um, so I go into detail about a lot of those. For example, one of them that has been used by a lot of agents is I call it the I have a buyer lie. And basically, a lot of agents will send out like postcards to a neighborhood and say, I have a buyer looking for a home in your neighborhood. Uh. And you call them up and it turn, you know, you have them come over and look at your house and and then it turns out they never really had a buyer, but you've now met them. A huge percentage of people, sellers or buyers, hire the first real estate agent they meet with. So, you know, being that first person in the door has some great advantages. And so basically then they're able to get that listing. Um, and another a major one for sellers, I call it the high price lie. And that's basically where they go in and tell the seller a price for their home that is higher than it could possibly sell for. And the agent knows that, yeah. but they're just telling the seller that because of course the seller wants to hear that um, so that they'll get the listing. And then they know they're going to make them go through multiple price reductions until they get down to the point to the market value of the home where it'll actually sell. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's very, it's, it's, there seems to be like almost a, a, a secret society. Uh, I know that there's a, I think a blue book, uh, website where the actual selling prices are, are available to agents, but not generally available to the public. Is that true? Uh, you know, anymore, you can pretty much find all that information. Um, all of the county records are online here in the United States, yeah. where it tells you, you know, you can look up what anything sold for. And even if it has a mortgage and, you know, what the mortgage balance was at that time. Yeah. And a lot of websites out there on the are, are doing that too. the major portal websites. You can just go there and you can find the last sale of a property. Hey, David, tell me a little bit about uh, your Toastmaster speaking experience. I'd love to, to hear about that. So, yeah, I got into Toastmasters quite a while ago um, and I went through and got my distinguished Toastmaster award, which is you have to give about 50 speeches and do a lot of leadership roles and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then I, I got out of it for a little while, but I recently just got back into it again. Um, and yeah, I'm really enjoying it again. It's it's really it's a great organization so many people are afraid of public speaking and it just helps to get up there and practice 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 basically is what it's about 
Absolutely. Now, are you doing that both in the online mode as well as face to face? Yeah, some of both the, the club I'm a part of right now, they, they've gotten really good at doing it um, both. So we have an in person meeting and via zoom at the same time. Um, and it's really kind of cool because we have people coming in from all over the world, really. And then we have all our people here in Denver as well at the same meeting. Is there a, is that type of a gateway? I don't know much about Toastmasters. Is that sort of a gateway to TEDx? Is, is that how that works? Or Well, actually, there are a lot of uh, people in Toastmasters who are trying to get there to like TEDx for sure. Yep. But it's, it's basically just an organization that helps you improve your public speaking and leadership skills. Fantastic. Now, when you do speak, you're obviously speaking about real estate and primarily, what are the other things that I guess during a, a, a talk that you give that people ask you the most? Well, I guess one of the main things is people ask about how, you know, how best to go about finding a good agent is, mm. is a question I get often. And I do go into detail in uh, later chapters of the book one about finding a great buyer's agent and one about finding a great uh, listing agent or seller's agent. And, uh, you know, really it comes down to interviewing several agents and asking them all the same questions so that you can then compare them and, and figure out who is the best fit for you and who hopefully will, will you know, rip you off and will, will charge you a reasonable amount. <laughs> so how do you go about this? I mean, is there a checklist? Do you ask for testimonials? Do you say, hey, look, can I have access to your previous clients? What's the process for verification? Yeah, a little bit of all. I do actually have an interview checklist that you can download off of um, my website. Mm -hmm. And um, it's actually not the Agents Are Liars website. That's uh, for the book itself. But I, yes, I, yes. I set up a, a website. It's called honestethicalexperience.com, where it's basically set up to allow you to find an honest, ethical, experienced agent. Yep. And you can download those checklists there. And then um, I go into a little bit about that you should look at you know, reviews. However, you need to be a little skeptical about that reviews online um, because there are a lot of fake reviews out there, um, yeah. both yeah. both good and bad, I would say. Uh, you know, sometimes you have like a disgruntled agent, you know, putting a bad review on another agent. So yes. Site, for example. Um, so you got to be, you know, take those with a big grain of salt, I'd say. Yep. Um, but it is also fair to ask to speak to a past client as well. I have some past clients who are willing to, to speak to you know, some uh, other people that are thinking about hiring me. Yeah. Are there societies like, are there like um, uh, agent bodies, government bodies that regulate any of this sort of thing? And is that something people can use as well, do you think? Yeah. So uh, here, at least, we have the National Association of Realtors. Mm. And, you know, you have to follow, follow their co code of ethics, yep. agree to follow their code of ethics. And, and there are definitely some advantages there to hiring an actual realtor versus someone who's just a real estate agent. In Colorado, you can be a real estate agent without being a member of the National Association oh. of Realtors. So uh, yeah, definitely, I think there's, for, for a cons consumer out there, it's good to you know hire a re an actual realtor. So do you think that the, I guess, the percentage of uh, cowboys, quote unquote, versus uh, legitimate, uh, honest and ethical agents is improving? You know, um, a lot of it depends on the market. Right. So what we're going through right now with a little bit of a slowdown is leading to a lot of desperate agents because sales uh, are down, way yep. down. Yep. So you're actually more likely to run into lies right now, I would say, than in a good market. Right. Um, and then the problem with a, a really hot market like we had, you know, over the two years right after COVID <laughs> was... Um, you get a ton of people coming into the business and those people don't even necess necessarily even realize that they're, you know, saying things they shouldn't because they just don't have any experience. But, you know, hiring somebody who's brand new is, is not necessarily the best idea. I actually uh, have a chapter about that. It's too easy to become a real estate agent in my book. And I talk about some things that I think should be changed along those lines. I think we should have um, more education requirements. I think we should have more continuing education requirements. And I think new agents should be required to apprenticeship under someone, yes. an experienced agent for at least a year. You know, I mean, a, a real estate transaction is one of the largest transactions anyone ever does. 
And I think you, it's only fair that you hire somebody who's competent to, yeah. to do that job. Yeah, it makes sense, doesn't it? Now, um, you've talked about checklists earlier and, and all these wonderful things that people can do. It seems to me, not having um, taken too much time to read the book yet, that um, it could be used as a cover-to-cover -cover read or is it more of a guide that people can go back to as they need to? It can be both. I, I would recommend reading it cover-to-cover, -cover, but then going back, especially to the chapters about finding a good agent once it's time to actually find a good agent. Now, um, we've talked a lot about the things that other agents are doing and it's, it's kind of uh, definitely absolutely revealed how you operate when people want to engage with you. Where do they find you again, please? And, and what is the onboarding sequence for you? Because I, I so, presume that you have to uh, interview them just as much as they would you. Oh, yeah. For, you mean for a buyer or a seller, yeah. for mm. example? Yeah, so um, they could find me on my website, the agentsareliars.com website, mm. or also uh, on, I have numerous other websites. <laughs> um, my, uh, my brokerage is called the principal team at Metro Brokers. Right. Um, and it can also be found at the, uh, the principal team .com. Um And yeah, just uh, basically what usually happens is, you know, a buyer will contact me and I'll go through, you know, what they're looking for. Um, and then will actually then meet in person at some point. And for sellers, typically, you know, it's best if I can go over and see their home, uh, get to know them a little bit, take a look at the home and then come up with a price that I think their home would sell for. Yeah. And I lose out on a lot of listings because I'm honest about that price. Yeah. And, you know, so there are a lot of agents out there telling inflated prices. No, and you um, you're not willing to do that. Correct. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it's fair to the seller because they typically will end up netting less yeah. on the sale of their home once they go through multiple price reductions and, and eventually sell it than if they had just priced it right from the beginning. You know what I like about you, David? You've got a conscience and, you know, it, it shines through and you can sleep uh, well at night. How good does it feel um, when you've done the right thing by your clients? It feels really good. You know, uh, one thing that I didn't talk about is about how buyers can save a lot of money. Ah, and yeah. that is um, hero programs. So basically, I was a founder of a hero program here in Colorado, and there's national ones and I'm sure international ones as well. But basically what we do is we give back to people who have served our country and our communities, yep. such as veterans, uh, first responders, educators, healthcare workers. And what we do specifically with our hero program is I give a portion of the commission I earn because the commission is paid by the seller, the buyer's agent commission yep. is paid by the seller. I give a, a percentage of that commission to the buyer to help pay their closing costs. Oh, and wow. with, like with veterans, for example, our hero program, we pretty much cover all of the closing costs for veterans. And the VA loan is um, you know, 0% down, 100% financed. So they can actually buy a house for nothing. A lot of yes. times. Wow, that's great feedback. Thank you very much. Now, you're doing some incredibly uh, good work. Um, you're honest, ethical, all of the great things we've spoken about. You've got a book that people can look at. Just again, please, what is the primary website that you would send people to first should they want to start working with you? Well, I'd say so that they can, uh, you know, get a feel for uh, how I work and, yep. and everything would be like, look at agentsareliars.com. Yep. Um, I, and then they can contact me right through there. I think that would be great because, you know, I think that there's, like I mentioned at the beginning, there's too many people that don't even realize that their agent did, you know, lie to them in the past. Mm. And I think that, um, that they need to, you know, open their eyes. <laughs> yeah, look, um, <laughs> and, uh, I, I, don't, I, think, I, I would hate to be that person on the, on the wrong end of the stick. I can only imagine how they would feel, I guess, uh, do you, you work with a lot of people that have been stung before, David? Definitely, yeah. Um, you know, one other thing that a lie that has happened to a lot of sellers, and it costs them a huge amount of money, is, um, you know, commissions are, are variable here, and they're also always negotiable. Yeah. Um, so when you list a home, and we have a lot of discount agents here in Colorado, in, including me, I do all my listings for a discounted commission. Mm. And um, it's basically kind of the model that, you know, I discount it and then I do more business and it works very well for me. Yep. But, you know, there's especially when you get up to a home that's like a million dollars, for example, the difference between hiring 
an agent charging less and a higher agent charging more can amount to a whole lot of money. I mean, we can, you're that. talking like, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 sometimes. Yeah, it certainly adds up. Well, look, if you're on today's call and you're interested in this space, you're either a buyer or a seller, you want to learn more, you want to learn, uh, look out for the, I guess, the tricks, the tactics, the downfalls and the upsides to everything that uh, David's involved with, make sure you visit agentsallies.com. No matter where you see this post, you're going to find that link back to David and all of his wonderful work. And David, thank you so very much for joining me on the My Future Business Show today. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Hey there, it's Rick Nusky. If you're looking for a better, more cost-effective way to promote your business, then lock in your spot on the My Future Business Show today. Just go to our bookings page, follow the prompts, and I'll talk with you soon.